and thank you to those who are joining us on on the live stream and also those who are looking at the recording uh after the launch which is here on monday so as is sort of traditional with uh, green party meetings i'd like to start with a moment of attunement that's just a moment of silence where people can reflect on their day uh, reflect on what's been happening to them recently um, maybe reflect on some of the things that are important to you about living or working in Oxford and also those who want to remember uh, Prince Philip and, and the great work he did for nature conservation you know the founding president of WWF and the work he did connecting young people with the great outdoors through Duke of Edinburgh Wars it's also time for you to reflect on that so we'll just start with uh, a minute of silence. Well, thank you very much. Uh, welcome. So um, let me start by uh, passing straight on to Chris Jarvis, who's one of our uh, lead candidates for the county and, and the city. And we're here to talk about City Manifesto. And he's a great person to introduce you all to the manifesto. So I'm just going to stop my screen sharing and hand over to Chris. Thank you so much, Craig, um, and thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Um, and for all of those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, the masses of people watching live being broadcast across Oxford on our Facebook page, thank you for setting aside some time um, on this Monday evening to join us. I'm getting a little bit of feedback when I speak. Yeah, I think that's now fixed. Thank you for that. Sorry. Um, to interrupt. Um, so I won't take up a huge amount of your time um, just uh, because we've got a stellar lineup of guests um, that I would love for you to hear more, far more of than you'll hear from me. Um, but I wanted to say a few words um, just to start this event to launch our manifesto for the 2021 Oxford City Council elections. And for me, I feel incredibly honoured to be speaking to you at the launch of our manifesto this evening. And I feel honoured because when I moved to Oxford five years ago, I was really struck by how many wonderful things there are about this city. I mean, we all, love in, we, we all live in this city. We know how wonderful this city can be. We know about the endless community spirit, that community spirit that we've seen so much um, in the last year through the mutual aid networks that have popped up across the city through community WhatsApp groups that have sprung up everywhere. Um, we're a city that is a, has a history that's steeped in radical political tradition. Um, we've had a strong green presence here in Oxford for a very long time and that's a really proud tradition that we have in the city. We obviously have an incredibly internationalist outlook as a city um, with uh, a city here in Oxford being built on migration, being built on people from all across the world coming to make this city their home, whether they're coming to the university or coming to live here and work here. We're obviously also a city that has a huge commitment to teaching, to learning and to world leading research, not just in the famous Oxford University, but also the university that I attended, Oxford Brooks University. We have an incredible culture and history of teaching and learning and informing people about the world that they live in. And we're also a city with hundreds of years of history and culture that's etched into its very fabric from the spires of the colleges all the way to the murals that adorn the walls across Cowley Road. And this was a city that when I moved here, I felt like I really wanted to be a part of, that I really wanted to call home. But it was also clear there were so many things wrong with our city as well. Oxford, as many of you will know, is the most unaffordable city outside of London. We have rents among the highest of anywhere in the country. Rough sleeping and homelessness is absolutely out of control. And we have frankly shocking levels of inequality in both wealth and in power. And on top of that, our city and its environment is under threat. Our air is so polluted, so toxic, that at times it's even been illegal. And I don't think that this can go on. 
For far too long, whether it's the Tories in the county council or Labour in the city council acting like Tories, the people of Oxford have been let down. They've been let down on housing, they've been let down on the climate and ecological emergency, and they've always been let down on inequality. But we're not here today to talk about everything that's wrong with the city. We're here to talk about an alternative because there is an alternative to that housing crisis, to rough sleeping, plaguing our streets, to the climate emergency not being taken seriously by our council and our councillors. We don't have to put up with this anymore. We do have that alternative and that alternative is the Green Party and it's a truly green Oxford. So what would a green Oxford look like? Well, for me, a green Oxford would look like tackling the housing crisis properly. We'd massively invest in social housing. We'd introduce a living rent to give private renters like myself a fair deal on their housing. We'd introduce a council backed letting agency to deliver fair and secure contracts for all. And a green Oxford would take real action on the climate crisis. Now, the Labour Party in Oxford like to pay lip surface and like to spin the things they're doing in City Hall to make it seem like they're taking action on the climate crisis. But we know, we've seen time and time and time again, that it's only the Greens that will, will take that crisis seriously. So what we need, we need urgent action to ensure the council reaches net zero carbon emissions well before 2040. We need to invest massively in renewable energy. That's energy owned by the community and owned by cooperatives. And we need to amend the local plan to make sure that every single new residential and commercial building in the city is net zero carbon. And finally, a green Oxford would build back better from the COVID crisis. We've seen this year how COVID has exposed so many of the injustices, the inequalities that we've just been talking about and that we've seen over the last 12 months. We can't go back to business as usual. We can't go back to the status quo. What we need to do is we need to deliver a Green New Deal for our city, for Oxford, ensuring that our economy is strengthened and supported and that people and the planet are put first over private profit and the interests of the few. We need to create a food strategy for Oxford that ensures everyone has access to healthy, affordable and sustainable food. And we need to ensure that our public services are well resourced, well funded and in the hands of the public and protected from privatisation. So for me and for our manifesto, that is what a green Oxford would look like. That's the kind of city that I want to live in. I hope it's the kind of city that you all want to live in. And I believe this is the kind of city that we can build together. Now on May 6th, we have an unprecedented set of local elections here in Oxford. We have elections to both the city and to the county council. We have the chance to elect more Greens into office in our city than ever before. But we'll only get that with your support and your help. If you believe in our vision for a fairer, greener and more equal Oxford, then get on board and get involved. Every single door that is knocked on, every leaflet that is delivered gets us closer and closer to getting more Greens in office and getting those ideas and that vision uh, into a reality. So thank you so much for coming this evening. I'm not gonna take up any more of your time because we've got incredible speakers coming up to say far more interesting things than I have. Um, but thank you for listening to me. Thank you for coming to our manifesto launch and together let's build a fairer greener Oxford on the 6th of May. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for that uh, very inspiring and, and informative introduction or summary, I should say, of our uh, 2021 manifesto. And there'll be opportunities later to ask questions um about the manifesto and to ask questions of some or other candidates or chris diane but first i'd just like to take the opportunity to introduce uh, jonathan bartley so people know jonathan bartley is the co-leader of the green party in england and wales and it's a great pleasure that he's able to to join us uh today and talk a little bit about you know the work of greens are doing in local government around the country and you know the wider context of why it's really important to vote green so uh, Jonathan, over to you. Thanks very much. And thanks so much, Chris. That was really inspiring. It sounds like an absolutely amazing manifesto. It's so exciting to see a programme being set out like that, which encompasses, as you said, Chris, absolutely everything from housing through to inequality uh, to public services to the climate emergency. Um, that we are 
offering a whole package to local government. And, you know, that's really, um, in my experience, for those who don't know, I lead the opposition on Lambeth Council in South London, where we are, have become, against the Labour administration, the party of the working class, the party of those on uh, the housing estates who face six estates facing demolition. Um, and when people have seen that and they responded to it, we've overturned and won seats in Labour's safest seat in the entire borough. So you've got a one-party state. It was a one-party state in Lambeth, but because we stood up against the state demolition, uh, we actually managed to overturn and win uh, a seat that was Labour's safest seat in the whole of Lambeth. No, there's really nothing that we can't do. Uh, and in Oxford, you are doing it. And I'm really excited to see what's going to happen. A quick reminder, because we've just been in these strange circumstances for the last year, 18 months. But in the last local elections, uh, we doubled in one election uh, our number of councillors, went from being the opposition on five councils to playing a part in running 17. Now, we hear a lot about Bryden and Hove, but of course, we're also playing a part in running 16, maybe 17 now. I lose count other councils around the country. And just reflect on that in 40 years of the Green Party trying to win council seats in just one night, we did 40 years work. That's, that's what happened last time. It's absolutely astonishing achievement. Um, and I am hoping, uh, and let's see if we can do it, because we are ambitious that we are going to be pushing past 400 councillors next time uh, in these local elections on May the 6th, that we will pay, become the largest party, perhaps if we can do it in places uh, like Bristol, uh, that we will be having massive surges in places like Burnley. Um, all around the country, I think we're going to see some very significant gains and it's because we have Green councillors working in their communities. We don't have that base vote on which you know everyone else relies. If you've been out and you've been canvassing and you've knocked on doors, you will often hear people uh, say, I'm voting Labour or I'm voting Conservative. And you say, why? And they say, because my dad or my mum voted Labour or Conservative. And they've got no bigger reason than that. Um, we know that the biggest barrier uh, for us is people believing that Greens can get elected. In Oxford, you've done that, you've broken through that barrier. And when we broke through it in Lambeth, we went from one councillor to being the official opposition in one election. Uh, and in Oxford, it really can happen. And I know you know it can happen. Um, and I'm hoping that one day, soon, we will see Greens running the council in Oxford and then we will see a parliamentary seat coming out of Oxford because that's what you need to do. You need to get that councillor base and then you win the parliamentary seat under first past the post. And I'm really hoping we're going to see that in Oxfordshire. Um, I've got a very limited time to speak. I think I've got four minutes left. So I'm going to go very, very rapidly about what we're doing with those councillors. I'm going to speak from my own personal um, situation as well in Lambeth, but Remember in Brighton and Hove, we've just seen an amazing budget passed where we've had 27 million pounds passed by that council towards climate emergency action. In places like Norwich, we're seeing uh, retrofitting schemes that will uh, create hundreds of jobs along the lines that Chris set out in terms of the Green New Deal uh, for the local area. We've seen uh, councillors stand up against tree felling uh, in places like Sheffield and launch a massive, massive campaign uh, to challenge the council at every level. I know that there will be councillors here that have got their hands dirty and they know often it's about fixing the potholes or fixing the pavements, um, but it's also genuinely making a difference to people's life on an individual basis. Um, the other day, before, well, the other day, before lockdown, uh, I was walking along Streatham High Road and I had a, a tap on my shoulder and I swung around and there was uh, someone who said, do, do you remember me? And I, I took a moment to register and then I remembered uh, this was a constituent of mine that had come to my surgery, a, a guy called Mansur. And he was a refugee, uh, disabled, living just around the corner from where I am now. And he turned up at my surgery uh, and the, the strain on his face um, was powerful. He said, I've just had uh, the bailiffs call me up on the phone and they say they're coming around to take away my possession. And I said, why is this? He said, because because I was given a council tax bill by the council uh, of 300 pounds and I couldn't pay it 
So the council levied court fees on me and summonses on me and fines on me. And now this bill is over a thousand pounds and I can't pay it. And now they're gonna come around and take my possessions away. Uh, a disabled refugee living in temporary accommodation with three children. And I said, well, man, so here's my phone number. Uh, if they come round, I will you know, call me and I will rush around and I will stand in the way or I'll not let them come in to your home. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll go away and see what we could do. Two weeks later, we had managed to not just get all the arrears cancelled and written off, but his original council tax bill written off. And he stopped me in the street and he, he was a Muslim and he hit his chest and he said, every night I thank God before I go to bed for what you've done for me. And his face had just changed. His life had been transformed. And there are councillors, hundreds of councillors, green councillors up and down the country doing exactly that day in, day out, transforming lives on the ground. And we often hear about the climate emergency motions that we pass. And those are absolutely crucial. We hear about the amazing uh, policies that we get changed and introduced, like Brighton and like Norwich and like Sheffield. Um, but we don't often hear about the gritty day-to-day -day work uh, that local Greens are doing. And it's because we do that work that we get more Greens elected because people hear about this, they see that we make a difference. And we know they know that we're hungry for it. They know that we have to work 10 times harder than anyone else to get elected because we don't have that natural base vote that we can be complacent on and we can rely upon. But it means that when you do get a Green elected, they do 10 times the work because they really wanted it. They've had to work to get there. I'll leave you with this story again from, from Lambert where we got our breakthrough um, in this ward is just around the corner from some sheltered housing and there the Labour Council were going to demolish this sheltered housing uh, and we had residents come to us even before we were elected uh, and say uh, we have a Labour Council demolishing our sheltered housing and we can sell it off to developers we have Lib Dem councillors who don't want to know the Tories this will be familiar to you are never around they don't do anything will you help us uh, and we said, yeah, we will. So we went around, we got a petition going, we put posters in the windows, we put out press releases, got them some coverage on the front page of the South London Press. We took them in to meet the chief executive and we saved their sheltered housing. Now in that sheltered housing, again, people on low incomes, working class, people born and bred in Streatham, Clapham, surrounding area. Um, many of them would have voted UKIP. Um, many of the voted would be Labour voters, or even some working class conservative voters. Now the majority of those residents in that sheltered housing will be voting green because we've earned the right to have their vote. And we need to earn that right. We can't just expect people to vote green. We have to go and say, what can we do for you? We have to go and get our hands dirty. We have to earn the right to be heard. And now we have people from that sheltered housing asking us, well, why do you do this? What's the connection to the climate emergency? What's the connection to your values and principles? And it gives us the right to be heard. And when we go out canvassing, one of those residents comes with us, 80 year old Barbara, and she has a scrapbook of all the press cuttings and everything that we did. And when we take her around on the doorsteps and we knock on the door, she won't leave that doorstep until they have promised to vote green because she brings out her scrapbook and she says, look what these people did for me and what they will do for us. Why would you not vote for them? And that's the question that hopefully we can be asking on the doorsteps in Oxford. Why would you not vote Green with this manifesto, with the work that our local councillors do for the local community, with us standing on the side of those who need a voice, the voiceless, who are neglected by a council that often doesn't listen. So go for it, go out for it. I'm looking forward to seeing the results uh, on May the 7th, May the 8th, and whenever they're coming in. So I know they're coming in over a few days after May the 6th. Um, but good luck, and we're all behind you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Much, uh... A great, uh, again, a very inspirational talk. And it's very uh, easy to forget when you're focused on your local street and your local community that the, one of the great strengths of the Green Party is we're part of this wider movement. And we should be drawing more on the strength and the ideas that we hear from places like Lambeth and others, where there's great progress as well. And, uh, and just to your point, I mean, you only have to walk down the street with a Green Councillor in our area, just to, you don't get very far before someone stops you and says hello. And, says thank you for what they've done so that again that just shows that we really do earn every vote and and that's so Im so important for the sustainability of the party sustainability communities as well so thank you for that 
So it's it's my great pleasure to introduce Diane uh, Regisford, who's one of our uh, lead candidates on the city and the county elections, who's standing for University Parks and Hollywell Ward. So great pleasure to introduce you, Diane, and you're going to talk a little bit about how we do politics differently. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, pleasure to see everybody in the room. Uh, such a great turnout and to hear um, Jonathan and also Chris speak. I'm really captivated. Yes, when we talk about uh, doing politics differently, one of the strengths we have as a Green Party, I believe, is our grassroots focus. And I'm particularly interested um, in exploring with others how we do this. What does this really mean? How do we deepen democracy through participation? In my work on the ground and connecting with people and engaging with communities, especially those communities that are less seen, less heard, and therefore easily ignored by council. Um, what does participatory democracy actually mean? Um, for those of us who sit in conferences and boardrooms, um, in policy discussions, and that we explore this beautiful concept, my experience is that it doesn't really mean much on the ground. At the most basic level, even being able to raise a petition as a community that experiences life on the margins, away from the center, you know, is not something that we understand how to do. So I think we've got a lot of work and great opportunity in this time where we're emerging from the pandemic. We are looking for how, ways in which we can build back better. We've got opportunities to really deepen and I feel creatively engage the idea of what participatory democracy really means. So I've coined that into a slogan which I'm using in the campaign this year, connecting caring communities. And um, it's comprised of approaches and also what we'll actually do. The imagination, I feel we need to take the time to really sit with communities and deeply listen. Listen deeply. We've seen the council time and time again fail atrociously at engaging communities. When I speak about the imagination, I'm interested in ideas of how we actually reimagine what the relationship between those who we elect to be in office to represent us at the decision -making, in decision-making spaces actually can come with us and how we can create new spaces where we can together explore that, you know? So I think it's really important beyond moving uh, and looking at ideas of diversity, I think we need to double click a few times and really get to understand what does that really mean? It's more than um, placing a DNI officer in a space. When we look at Oxford City Council, we've got some statistics, we've got 22% um, of Oxford's residents um, from ethnic minorities. And this is against the national average of 13%. However, only 12% are engaged, um, employed at the Oxford City Council. And then there's a pay gap that exists, 9.4% um, against the national average of 2.3%. And the question remains, you know, why there's a pay gap and a pay difference in the first place for uh, people from ethnic uh, communities, your black, Asian, and ethnic minority groups. So reimagining this relationship between what local government means for us as communities on the ground, I think is really important. Our principals in the party were speaking last year when we were witnessing uprisings across the world for racial justice. Um, our principals were speaking about a politics of belonging and I feel a politics of belonging, again, is really important and I'm very excited by that, but without a culture of belonging, where we address the very pertinent issues that we're experiencing right now. Isolation, we heard a report last week that spoke about the numbers of young people that feel isolated, cut off um, from, their own, from their peers, be they students. You know, in my constituency, we're looking at 96% students. They feel very isolated, very cut off, very confused. How do we bring them into the center? How do we um, inspire and motivate participation? in local um, politics. So this is why we look at this idea of, I'm presenting this idea of connecting caring communities. 
we've spoken about um, the global diversity that exists in Oxford, but we also are very aware of the divide between the town and the gown. And for example, we have the Africa Society that exists at Oxford University. Um, I am a recent graduate from Oxford Brookes University, and there's a very strong community, but yet again, largely invisible. A large community of students from ethnic minority backgrounds have participated in research projects to look at attainment questions, why students drop out. We have the opportunity in this time to really engage this by deep listening, and this is what we speak about when we look at care by creating spaces where we can come together and cultivate a culture of inquiry and we have a really beautiful opportunity to do this in Oxford because we have such a high percentage of students um, of all ages it's not only your 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 undergrads but you have a high percentage I think it's 40 percent um, at Oxford University of postgrads and therefore this notion of inquiry, of putting our heads together to look at solutions together, therefore affirms this idea that I'm speaking about that never before has it been more important, I believe, that we gather in community to together navigate and create um, solutions for the society that we want to live in, a society which is just, which is equitable and which is humane. I, Feel I'll leave it there. I think I'm pretty much up to my time. Am I, Craig? How am I going? Perfect timing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. much. Yeah. It just but reminds I just me. Of... Yeah. Carry on. Yeah, I just wanted to wrap up and say that you know, in terms of the manifesto that we're presenting, the healthier communities, the prosperous economy, and this idea of Oxford being a global city, we know and we understand that social inclusion is absolutely fundamental to ensure this thriving um, society, but also a, an economically stable city so you know it's important for very many reasons thank you very much thank you diane it's such so important the way we engage with the people who voted us in and elected us and uh, reminds me of something a, a labor councillor said to me once i was asking him you know how how do you engage with your electorate he said well once every four years and that was the extent of the engagement he said well if people don't like what i do they can vote me out you know in four years time so I think, you know, green politics means doing things differently. And that goes all the way to engaging the people that elected us, you know, year round, door knocking, you know, responding, talking, you know, and involving people in decision making. And of course, in Oxford, we used to have local area parliaments where people could engage and residents did turn up and getting involved in decision making. It wasn't just, a, you know, you sit and listen to your councillors councillors were there to talk to it and Labour abolished them so we no longer have those very community led uh, fora that we used to have which was a great great shame and the Greens mourned the loss as did very many residents. So um, now it's a good opportunity to uh, ask uh, any questions that people might have of Diane or Chris. Um, so uh, do anyone have does everyone have any questions? If you do, if you put them into the chat, um, we can sort of direct them to Chris or Diane as appropriate, or uh, maybe another uh, candidate who might be on here or councillor. Um, and while people are thinking of that, I had a couple of questions that were submitted in advance. And our first one is, um, Oxford is a very diverse city indeed, Diane's mentioned that. What would Greens do to more effectively reach out to underrepresented groups um, without a voice in the council decision making? So maybe a uh, Diane, you've spoken about this a bit, but maybe I'll, I'll direct it towards Chris. I'm ever so sorry, my internet cut out a little bit there. Would you be able to repeat the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's just that the Oxford's a very diverse city. What would the Greens do to more effectively reach out to uh, underrepresented groups without a voice in the council decision making? And Diane, feel free to chip in as well. Right. Yeah. So I can, I can jump in first. And yeah, as, as Craig says, Diane, um, add anything you want to. Um, so I think actually what what Craig was just talking about there about the 
the way that Greens do politics differently, where we put the people that we represent first um, above the elected office, above um, our own party interests is really important in, in this sense, because um, it is Greens that are spending uh, the, the entire year when we're not locked up in our houses and the lockdown, at least um, speaking to residents and speaking to people at their houses on the doorstep and bringing them into the democratic processes, asking them what the issues are that matter to them rather than telling them what the issues that we care about first and foremost are. Now, I think um, on top of that, I think the other thing I would say is that um, actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to heap some praise on, on Craig a little bit because Craig's been Lord Mayor, uh, was Lord Mayor for a year uh, previously. And we've got another previous Lord Mayor, another Green Lord Mayor on the call, I can see as well. Um, and actually the work that um, Craig has done as Lord Mayor and also before him when Elise was Lord Mayor was actually, I think, fantastic at building connections and relationships between the council and Oxford's very diverse communities um, and uh, making sure that we are... Uh, constantly representing the the city in its in its in its full diversity, whether that be with uh, diversity in age, uh, you know, engaging with with young people, with old people, whether that be racial diversity, whether it be diversity when it comes to gender or sexuality. Um, actually, um, when Greens are in office, we have been uh, been been I think very effective at. Uh, reaching those groups, about speaking to them, about bringing those issues to the fore. And actually, there are people in this room who are embedded in the uh, the communities that we're talking about, who are involved in, you know, Oxford Pride, who are involved in uh, the trade union movement, who are involved in all these different aspects that I think is really important. Um, and I'll leave it there so we can get as many questions in as possible. Yeah, Diane, would you like to add anything? Yes, I would. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We have an opportunity, I believe, to understand what lived experience, this term that is very, very fashionable and literally trending at the moment, especially in third sector spaces. Um, what does lived experience really mean? I believe with engagement that is really genuine, that is equitable, so we create spaces which are neutral, where we're not using language that alienates people, for example. We have the opportunity to translate lived experience into something um, that I feel is more tangible, which is experiential knowledge, knowledge you know, that we gain that has a value in this knowledge economy. And this is what communities hold. They're very specific ways of doing things. They're very specific ways um, which are not documented necessarily that community groups themselves don't even always recognize because they're just always at the coalface. But what we do know in this particular time as we're speaking now is that community leaders are exhausted. They're absolutely exhausted because they've been really at the coalface responding, 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 responding. So to create spaces of sanctuary, spaces of healing, I think would be something that we could look at and create very easily. Additionally, um, post-election, what we're going to be doing with the Oxfordshire Green Party is I will be um, exploring with the party how we create an equitably um, resourced post for diversion, diversity and inclusion officer and we also have plans to set up a panel um, so that we can really hold the council and others to account you know um, in terms of how they're not only achieving targets but really being creative and as I said earlier on engaging this idea of how we reimagine the relationship between community and um, those in authority those who are put there to represent them thank you great thank you very much Diana and, and one point that uh, I should just pick up from uh, is that obviously I've been a councillor for, for 20 years and uh, and we're the only party that doesn't operate a party whip. So when we talk about representing communities, many Labour or Lib Dem or Conservative councillors are simply unable to represent what their communities want because they're bound to vote with the whip, to vote with the rest of their party members. And I think that's a real strength of the Green Party. You know, we try and reach consensus and we try to vote together but actually, if there's something in your community that really you've been asked to represent a view in your community, you're free to do so, free to vote the way that your conscience tells you you should vote. And that's a real strength. Uh, and when you vote for another party, you can't be sure whatever they say, they're going to really represent the interests of the local community that elected them. 
and that's that's sad i think and something we're very proud of the green party for not enforcing a whip on elected politicians so so thank you for that we have another a question come in um which is uh could diane and chris tell us a bit about how campaigning is going and how receptive receptive people on the doorstep have been to our manifesto so chris you like to yeah i mean uh I've only, unfortunately, I've been shielding um, for most of the, the, the campaign, but uh, luckily I'm now to Jab Jarvis, having had both my vaccinations. So I'm now back out on the doorstep and the, re the, the response has been absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's rare that I knock on a door um, and uh, the residents don't know the name of our two sitting councillors in the area that I, um, I'm standing in. Um, you know, the work that Craig and Dick Wolf um, have done um, over the years to... Uh, properly engaged with the community has been fantastic and um, it's really telling that almost every door I knock on um, I, I have to break the news sadly that Craig won't be restanding this time because he's been such a, a, a great voice for uh, for their community the response we've been getting is fantastic um, I'm, I'm, I mean it's very rare that you find a Tory voter in Oxford um, at the moment um, but I've actually had more people say they're voting Tory than are voting Labour it's clear that um, the Labour Party is um, is is in decline and that the greens uh, at least in this part of the city are definitely on the rise and i'm i'm feeling very confident and i hope uh, our other campaigns and candidates will be as well um but i'm sure diane can speak a little bit about that too yeah diane you're obviously speaking to a very different uh, electorate some people obviously mostly students as you said in your area who haven't you know had that history that people in in the area that chris is standing have so what's what's the reception been like on the doorstep well, it's been difficult to get to students face to face because they haven't been there for the most part or we're met by um, very cold and stern faced porters who are saying no 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 we can't uh, let you in or, or deliver your um, leaflets yet but we are um, engaging students through social media and um, we know that when they are back in a couple of weeks time some very direct um, communications that will be sent out to them will also help us gain um, more insight into how they're feeling. But what we have heard on the ground from the students that are on ground, the medical students are there, for example, um, are concerns about how the government is handling the vaccine, the rollout of the vaccine, how, um, again, uh, students are feeling very isolated. The residents in University Parks, we have 20% residents. Um, we've had some really exciting uh, responses when, for example, they see this um, canvassing card say oh really you're standing oh wow then okay so i've seen on a couple of occasions somebody who's been sitting on the fence actually yes oh yeah i might vote. oh yes okay, elections are coming all right oh you're standing okay yes i'll take this and yes i'm voting you know so there's, there's a great energy on the ground my sense is that people really want something different and they're interested to see what we can come with so we've been having some really really engaged um conversations and um in terms of issues housing the low traffic neighborhoods and isolation. I would say those are the three big ones right now. Oh, the other one is green spaces. They really want more green spaces. So again, that lines up with our manifesto and what we're looking at in terms of creating more fountains and green spaces within um, in Oxford. You know, for the students uh, who are mostly in the city, one student said, you know, there's so much concrete. And, you know, it's true. I think for those of us who live in the shires, you know, further out, you could, you know, very easily understand, you know, believe that Oxford is very, very green, you know, in terms of its green spaces, but in the cities, actually, yes, there is a lot of concrete. So um, that was something that was brought up a couple of weeks ago. But we're getting great reception on the ground, really great. Yeah, no, thank you, Diane. I think that you raise an interesting point, which is, you know, we're having conversations with people. If anyone's been subject of a Labour canvas recently, you know, they, they knock on the door, I vote in Labour, yes, no, and then they move on to the next one. And I think that's really says a lot about how we do engagement how we do campaign and how we want to listen to people and understand what they want and yes convince them sometimes if they you know think of voting someone else why it's important to vote green and and how the greens you know as we've said repeatedly in our literature you know we're the only ones holding the council to account and it's a labor-run council and if you want to make sure that you know power doesn't corrupt then it's important to to vote green and have some accountability so um We've got uh, another question here, uh, which was about, and do keep the questions coming. Um, let me just check the latest one. So we've got, uh, 
So again, this is a sort of another uh, a related question to one we've had before, but it says, it strikes me there are many communities in each ward, but what mechanisms are there in place that bring them together? How do Greens tap into these mechanisms? So it's about, I guess, the glue that holds communities together. How do we sort of, um, sort of tap into those things? And maybe Diane, I could start with you on that. Tapping into community spaces um, for me is about connecting to networks, existing networks. We have communities that are faith-based, for example, um, interest-based, geographically based. And um, whilst we have been in confinement, we have had the opportunity to engage virtually. And interestingly enough, this has enabled us to do things in community that perhaps weren't always able to do. So for example, what we've experienced in some of the African heritage communities, for example, um, there have been a lot of funerals. This is a reality that people are dealing with. And uh, yes, it's not always possible for everyone to go. So 20 people can go to a funeral. I'm not sure the numbers at this moment now. Um, but what we found is that what is traditionally a collective community-based process, that of grieving and getting closure, you know, um, we've been able to do through connecting via Zoom, via technology. So one of the ways in which we've been accessing communities is through connecting with community-based leaders and connecting uh, through technology. The other thing that I think is really important is to go on ground and speak to people because what we will find with a lot of community groups is that they're not registered and not always, I mean, more often than not, you'll find they don't have an online presence. They don't have a website that is set up because they're on ground doing the work. And so it's really important to have people in community on the ground who are connected. So I think the social capital and leveraging the social capital is one of the ways in which we do it. I've also started something called the Belonging Caravan. And this is a, an online space where we gather to in a contemplative way, which is non-threatening, um, to use imaginative processes. You know, I'm an artist, I come from an artistic background, I'm a social sculpture practitioner. And you know, when I speak about the imagination, I explore the, imag the, the, the intersection between the imagination and transformation. Everybody can imagine, you know, whilst we have the capacity to dream and, and, and to explore imaginatively. So this is a space where we come together to really look at what does belonging look like and feel like in this time. And this links to this idea of connecting caring communities and what we find is it's a very healing process people feel very relaxed and they feel you know the energetic connection between people so it's a way of finding connection uh, as opposed to really addressing difference and and that in itself um, creates a strong bedrock so i think we can really leverage technology to a great degree and now more and more we can gather you know face to face in at least you know groups of six etc thank you Great. No, that's that's really important. It reminds me of the sort of the fight we've had to save our community centres and community facilities, which is obviously one of those core meeting places, one of the bits of glue that holds communities together in, in East Oxford. You know, we're fighting against the you know closure of the East Oxford Games Hall and Film Oxford, which is where photographers and other artists come together. And um, so, and, you know, uh, reductions in space, the, the closure of the Chinese community centre in East Oxford and so we're really just been fighting that because as you say we recognize the importance of gathering places for people where communities of interest can meet and that's why you know we are fighting so much for our community spaces. So um, Chris if you don't mind I'll kick over you to the next question uh, which is about uh, councils are under a lot of pressure to privatize services. Uh, what are the Greens view on public uh, private partnerships? Yeah, um, so this is an issue that's incredibly close to my heart. My day job, I work for an anti-privatization campaign group. Um, and I think that we only have to look at the, the last 12 months um, of, of, of the handling of the pandemic to see just how damaging and dangerous privatization of our public services can be. I mean, nobody can possibly look at the way that the test and trace system has been handled um, by companies like Serco and Citel, um, who have pocketed millions of pounds of public money to deliver a completely failing system and think that privatization and outsourcing is a good idea. Um, and wherever privatization of our public services um, happens, 
um, it leaves a, a trail of devastation and destruction in its wake, whether it's the collapse of um, Carillion or whether it's, um, you know, the privatization of our railways or the privatization of our buses, which has seen, um, you know, millions of miles of routes cut, fares rocketing and so on and so on and so on. So the Greens um, have always been and always will be strongly in support of uh, public services being um, properly and fully in public hands, in public ownership, well-funded and well-resourced. Um, for a brief period, um, you know, the, the, the Labour Party flirted with the idea of public ownership um, for the, under Corbyn's leadership. It's not entirely clear where um, Keir Starmer stands, well, really on anything, um, but, but on, on privatisation specifically. Um, Prior to that, the Labour Party were, you know, the Labour Party was the, the party of, of PFI. The Labour Party was the, the, the party that promised to renationalise the, the railways, but didn't. Um, the Labour Party was the party that, um, you know, across the country in council chambers was outsourcing and cutting services left, right and centre. Whereas the Greens have always said there are some things that local government, that national government should be running through the state as a public service in the interests only of the public rather than um, of, of private profit. And we've seen at a local level, um, you know, that the, 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 the impact privatisation can have, how damaged it can, it can be, how it can undermine services. And right now, you know, we have um, uh, the leisure services in Oxford are the primary thing that is outsourced. And we have a company um, involved in running our leisure services, which has been um, you know, suffering uh, financial difficulties for a very long time. The Greens have long pushed for that service to be brought back in house because those services are vital for our communities, are vital for the public. And it's too risky to be um, in the hands of a company um, that isn't managing it properly um, and um, that uh, isn't giving people the service they need and is at risk of collapse. So my view is, and the Green Party's view is, that public services should be properly in public hands. And um, as a councillor, as, as a council group, Greens will be fighting tooth and nail to make sure that what services we do have insourced stay insourced and anything that we do have outsourced comes back in house where it belongs. Great, thank you very much. We've, we've Great, can, I say, can I say one yeah. thing just, just, yeah, sure. just to say, I mean, I think a lot of councils around the country are doing exactly what Chris has said, particularly around, for example, leisure contracts. We have a company, Greenwich Leisure in Lambeth and the council has had to actually bail them out uh, as a result. And it says costing dear. People in the local community recognize as well when they can't you know, call their public services to account because they're one stage removed and they're outsourced, how frustrating that is. And so there's a real opportunity there, I think, to make the case. Um, we were able to get on the front foot in Lambeth. Remember last year, we called very, very early on before anyone else as a, as a, at the national level uh, that there should be local uh, based test and trace. Uh, with involving public health authorities, involving local GPs and local authorities, because they're closest to the people. And we made the case in Lambeth, and they've now actually done that, and they've set up their own test and trace system locally in Lambeth. And it's Greens, you know, once again, that have led on that. Um, so I think there is a real opportunity everywhere for Greens to make this case uh, for public ownership, and particularly around public services at the local level. It, it should be an open goal that we're shooting at. Right. Thank you very much, John Zenek. Yeah, indeed, we did something similar in Oxford. We uh, worked very hard behind the scenes to get together a cross-party coalition to, to sort of put a, a, about bringing test and trace locally, involving the director of public health as well, and, uh, and managed to convince them. And uh, we now have a lot more localised. In fact, I think as the government finally realised, <laughs> localised test and trace is so much better. So um, thank you very much. We've had some great questions. Um, and I'd just like to sort of uh, end with um, a couple of uh, sort of slides here, just to show people um, that we have a full list of candidates. So we're standing uh, 48, 44 out of the 48 seats in Oxford City on the City Council, 23 out of 24 wards we're standing. You can see there's some of the lovely faces of our, our candidates in some of the key areas. Um, and a list of, of everyone's name there. And uh, this is really for the live stream so people can see who their names are, look in detail, look down the list and, uh, and see who's, who they've got chance to vote for in, in the local city council elections. And as has been said, because there's boundary changes this year, normally you'd just be voting for one councillor for the city council. Now you have the opportunity to vote for two councillors uh, and we hope you'll give both your votes to the Green Party. Um, and it'll be great to get more Greens elected to Oxford City Council. 
because as people have said, you know, we certainly have the policies, we're holding the council to account, and really the, the Greens that have been elected have been working very hard on people's uh, behalf. And uh, if you do want to get involved, we really encourage you to do so. And we have, uh, here's the information you might need. If you're interested to learn a little bit more about our manifesto, it's now on the greenoxfordshire.com website. You can go and look at the complete manifesto. We obviously only managed to touch on, on it here um, today. Uh, if you want to put our poster up, get involved in our action days, again, you can sign up greenoxfordshire.com events. You can also volunteer there. And if you have any further questions, we weren't able to cover all the questions uh, today, uh, then please do email to east at greenoxford.com and uh, we'll get an answer back to you. So I think we're slightly over time, but not too bad. Uh, so thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for attending, taking part, for watching the live stream, for watching the, the recording. Um, and do get involved, uh, as Chris said at the beginning, it really is a party for everyone. You know, we are really trying hard to, to um, we don't have sort of big business donating lots of money to us. We really uh, thrive and survive on everyone's efforts and the involvement of people. So do get involved, uh, whatever you can, sticking up a poster, uh, coming and doing some leafleting, coming and helping us canvassing, donating some money. If you've got money sitting in the bank, you're thinking, what can we do with that? Well, you can donate it to us. So have a, have a great day, have a great evening, have a great morning if you're watching this in the morning. Uh, and thank you very much. And let's elect more Greens in Oxford. Thank you.